All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very excited to see you all here this afternoon. My name is Chelsea Crawford. I am Chief of Staff at the Tennessee Department of Education. I want to thank you for taking some time this afternoon to come and spend with us to talk about a really important topic. We are here tonight to hear from you uh, and hear your input and hear your ideas as it relates to a new piece of uh, a new implementation of a piece of legislation that was passed several years ago. So. What we're going to do tonight is actually give you just a little bit of information about what it is that we're here to talk about. And then we're going to actually spend the rest of the time together, as, as much time as we would like to spend together tonight, talking through with you and hearing your comments about this particular implementation. I want to make sure to call out you all when you walked in this afternoon and checked in. There was a QR code where you were able to sign up and um, provide public comment this evening. I just want to make sure that you see that there are some uh, flyers on your table. If you have not yet signed up and you want to give some remarks tonight, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Also, as I go through kind of the presentation and just give us a little bit of a baseline around the topic that we're talking about, you can continue to sign up over the course of the afternoon. So don't feel like you need to hold back. You can definitely jump in at any time. Um, we are also going to have an email address available through September 15th. So things that you might share tonight, you might want to follow up on, you might want to iterate upon. Um, we are really seeking in, input and feedback from any Tennessean. That email account is schoolLetterGrades at tnedu.gov. And we'll have that on the, the presentation slides here tonight. It's on your flyers. I just want to make sure to, to recognize that that is an ongoing opportunity in addition to the conversation that we're going to have here this evening. So let's go ahead and dive right in. I want to welcome all of you again. Welcome the folks who are watching online. Really excited to have a discussion with you all about accountability as it relates to public schools here in Tennessee. So when we think about uh, this particular topic, I mentioned earlier that we are on track to implement a piece of legislation that was passed years ago. Uh, and of course, when we at, at the state agency are really working to implement laws and every, in every law and every implementation, every project that we undertake, we're really trying to make sure that we are providing as much access as possible for children to have high quality education. And so that's really kind of the spirit of the discussion here tonight it is, as it is every time we talk about these types of issues. And what we're talking about is school performance. When we think about students experiencing their education, they are graded, they get report cards that measure progress. We think about teachers in the classroom who are evaluated uh, and get measures on the, on the work that they are doing to support our kids. So too do we measure our performance at the school level and at the district level. Uh, and the accountability system is one that's pretty technical, uh, but it actually is really intended to provide families, parents, the public with information that is clear, understandable, comparable across schools and across districts so that we have the information we need to be able to support education, whether that's supporting your individual student at home, working with their teacher in the classroom, supporting your schoolhouse community, supporting your district. Uh, so this is really an exciting opportunity, I think, that we have to be able to implement this piece of legislation grounded in those ideals. We want to point out a, a, a few things, and I'll point up here to this slide so that you can see uh, what we're talking about. But the particular piece of legislation that we are rolling out this year for the first time will assign a letter grade, just like you see on a student report card, for schools in Tennessee. So schools will, later this fall, receive a letter grade of A, E, C, D, or F, just like you're used to seeing on a student's report card. Legislation requires that we include a couple of different indicators, metrics, in a calculation. There's a lot of opportunity for us to be able to co-create some of the additional considerations that could go into that calculation. And so tonight we are here in Greenville on the second of what will be 10 stops all around the state seeking public input and feedback on how we go about calculating a letter grade for a particular school. Um, when I mentioned that this was passed a number of years ago, there have been delays in the rollout of the, the implementation. 
because essentially data was off limits for use and accountability, but because this year is the first year that that data is not off limits, this law will be implemented this fall. And so we've got a really exciting opportunity here for the next month or so where we're seeking input and collaboration to co-create with Tennesseans all across the state the calculation that determines what letter grade a particular school would receive. You see here the, the timeline between when the law was kind of initiated, it was passed intending to be implemented in the 17-18 school year. So that was a number of school years ago. Uh, we also see that here we are in 2023. When we get ready to, to implement this law, you can expect to see letter grades in November, uh, right around the time that we release the state report card, which is what houses accountability data uh, on schools and districts. So at this point in time, we'll go on to the next slide. I wanted to provide just kind of a baseline understanding of the types of things we think about, we've talked about, we've used previously in various accountability frameworks. These are the types of things that we want to have a discussion about today, these and more. As I mentioned, as we are kind of creating the calculation that will determine a school letter grade, the legislation does require us to include academic proficiency, and what you can see up there in that top left-hand side with the little um, the star icon, it's really intending to measure how our students are mastering academic standards for a particular subject area in a particular grade. So we want to make sure that the, that the rigorous academic standards that Tennesseans co-created for our students are being, uh, are being met and the student is being supported all along the way, every grade level, every subject level towards proficiency in terms of uh, academic success. We also know that this legislation requires us to include a component of growth and you can see that over here as well. And that's really how much progress a student is making despite whether or not that student may be proficient. You see a couple other indicators up here. Um, the chronically out of school is an example of another indicator that could be included, depending on kind of what the input is. And really, chronic absenteeism is, uh, is what that chronically out of school indicator is intended to represent. Students who are having trouble coming to class when, you, when they're not in the classroom, of course, they're not accessing that wonderful instruction from a, a wonderful Tennessee teacher. So we want to make sure to, to provide a little bit of information on that particular indicator here for you all to be able to, to use as you're thinking through this topic. You'll see at the bottom English language proficiency is another type of indicator that we think about that we've utilized in other uh, circumstances and contexts within the accountability framework. You can imagine in a school where there are students who are learning the English language, they're actually learning to speak. Uh, the language that our textbooks are, are provided in, the, the instruction in the classroom is provided in English. And so that's another type of indicator that may contribute, may indicate performance, academic performance, academic success at a school level. We want to hear about your ideas here, and I want to take a moment to just call out that things can look different between different types of schools. When we think about elementary schools, versus middle schools and high schools, those different age students and different grade bands that those schools may be serving. And we consider the question of how, how might we uh, characterize, recognize, measure the school's academic performance. Um, those indicators could look different in elementary school versus middle school versus high school. Over here on the right hand side, you've got a couple other examples of the types of indicators that could apply certainly in, in the high school uh, environment, potentially even in the middle school environment as well, but you have the, the notion of students graduating ready to take on their next step and be successful in their next step after high school graduation. We wanna see not only do they walk across the, the stage at graduation night and uh, senior year and be uh, receiving a, a high school diploma, but we also know that we want them to be ready for their next steps, whether that's college, career, or military, some other pathway that a Tennessean might want to choose to provide for themselves or their family. Here's some indicators that we think about in the high school space. 
it's going to be interesting, I think, and we would love to hear from you all about types of indicators for elementary versus middle versus high school. Should there be considerations? And if so, what are they? So this is just kind of an example of the types of indicators that could go into the calculation that determines letter grades for schools in Tennessee. And what we're gonna do now is really turn and have a discussion and hear from you all, kind of your thoughts, your inputs, your perspectives. As I mentioned earlier, we know that later this year when our state report card is published, this will be the first time that schools in Tennessee have an A, B, C, D, or F letter grade. And I want us to think from a parent, a family member's perspective, you know, if you go on that website and you see your particular school uh, with your principal name and you've got lots of information about the students that are in that particular school and then you see the letter grade, what should that A letter grade signify? What should a B letter grade signify? Those are the types of things that we want to discuss here this evening. So the next section of this uh, um, uh, event, this town hall tonight, is really a, a group dialogue and it's public comment from you all. I, I am going to read through uh, a number of folks who have already signed up to speak and I know I've seen some of you kind of signing up as we have gone along here. But everyone will have a couple of minutes to kind of come, use a microphone, give us some input, give us your ideas, give us your concepts when it comes to answering a really critical question. So we think about what are your top priorities for measuring a, a school's academic success? How should we go about prioritizing those types of indicators? If we know that these are the things that are important to us, is there any kind of prioritization amongst those things? What should that A, B, C, D, F letter grade represent? What makes them different? What makes them stand, stand apart? And how would you define what each school could provide or should provide to students to receive that particular letter grade. So at this moment in time, I'm going to start kind of the public comment period. Um, feel free to expound upon anything we've talked about uh, or bring your own uh, comment and input. We are really excited to hear it. Uh, I will have uh, folks uh, use the microphone. Reed is here with the microphone just so that we can ensure everybody in the room can hear each other. I'll have a little bit of a timer going up here. I know that we could uh, spend a lot of time talking about these issues because they're very important to us. That's why we're doing these town halls. I also want to make sure to be respectful of the time that you're, you're volunteering and donating to this conversation tonight. So I'll have a couple minutes for everyone to speak. I'm going to start a timer up here just so that we can all hear it. Uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do is give some kind of visual cue when your clock is, is ticking down. I, back up when it's just about time for your turn to be over. Uh, but I know that we'll have a really good discussion here today. So at this point in time, we're going to start the public comment. And this evening, uh, it looks like there is a um, Nancy Brawlin who has signed up to speak. Yes, ma'am, I see you right here. Following Nancy, we're going to go to Suzanne Bryant. Suzanne, if you would raise your hand see you over here we'll bring the microphone to you next uh, and with that Nancy you are good to start your two minutes oh just feel free to stay yeah feel free to stay in or come on up here whatever you would like to do yes ma'am um, so uh, Nancy Brawley I, I uh, my experience has always been at a high school so I'm speaking strictly from a Cock County high school which is a very low performing school and when those grades come out this fall I'm already bracing myself so a couple of things that I want to consider number one as you all know the TVOS have been come out and it's basically only on numeracy and literacy can there be some um, our biology and our US history and other scores do just as well can we not somehow compute those into that accountability because if the state is paying for this EOC testing it ought to count towards our success instead of just ELA and math uh, number two that when the EOC quick scores come back to the high school there is such a misalignment between what the state says is the EOC grade I actually calculated that among all my subjects last spring so you had students that received in some cases a C as their EOC grade, but yet they were below expectations from a growth perspective. So therefore, you're basically passing the student and failing the teacher the way I look at it. And where the majority of my students, honey, their goal is to get a 59 and a half. So it, it, that's really challenging. The other thing is somehow can you take in the socioeconomic 
ability with your students. I mean, we're a Title I school. We've eaten free for years now. I mean, it's, it's what I deal with as an administrator on a daily basis about no internet, no pens, the foster care situation. I mean, it, it's just insane. So somehow that has to be accountable when you're not talking about being in with a two-parent home that somebody's at home making sure things happen. Uh, the other thing is, I don't know how you account, but at the high school level, in our situation, about only 30% of our teachers are what we call tested teachers. So when you have your CTE teachers and your gym teachers and your art teachers, it, it's really difficult. How can you measure their success some way in this grade so that it counts as well? Um, the staffing issues, everybody's facing those now. In our math department, every math teacher is teaching full eight blocks one is teaching seven. We had two positions open, zero applicants, and so they, you stepping back. <laughs> okay, so that uh, this, this qualification of who we're just, if you can breathe, we're gonna get you into our system, and it's so hard with the lack of training with the EPP program, how that happens. Um, and then that whole 95% attendance regarding if you're one, if you don't even test 95% of the kids. I mean, it's crazy. You have them coming in, and again, our kids, they're just going to take it to take it, particularly the ACT. At the high school level, again, we're, I, don't, I know it's quarantine, we're, we're, we're way down there. I'll just spit it like that with the ACT composite. But again, you're just telling the kids they have to take it to graduate. There's no minimum score for them for an incentive ways that, you know, so we, we really do need to think about that. Um, and the last thing about testing lengths, I don't know if this, if that's going to be part of our success, to grade academic success, I totally get that. However, when our ELA test alone at the high school is longer than the entire ACT test, something screwed up. When you're talking about doing instructional times where that's concerned, it's, it's unbelievably frustrating, uh, especially when whoever's legislator's kid didn't have enough time and they passed that law for the extra time. And, okay, we can't do that on the ACT. We shouldn't be doing that at the high school level at all. And then finally, when you start measuring success from a grade level, we as educators, uh, you know, our best practice is to differentiate among your students. This type of accountability in this grade level does not differentiate among schools whatsoever. So with that, I think I've said enough, so I'll sit down. Thank you. Nancy, thank you so much for your comments. I can tell you've been thinking about, about this a lot, and I appreciate you kicking us off with a strong start here this afternoon. Next up, we have Suzanne Bryant. Following Suzanne is going to be Mr. Steve Starnes and Steve, Steve Ussie, so we'll bring in the microphone here in just one moment. And with that, Suzanne, ready for you anytime you're ready. Hello, I'm Suzanne Bryant. I'm the Assistant Director of Schools for Instruction for Greenville City Schools. And I really want to think about the model with which we measure schools. First of all, there is a calculation for letter grades, and it's been in place for many years, even though it hasn't been implemented. So this would be a change in a calculation to data that we've already accumulated, and it's kind of like changing the rules in the middle of the game. So I would suggest any change would be going forward and not backward. But grades should be based on growth. When you look at a school and you look at just a measure of achievement, that's not measuring the school effect or the teacher effect on student learning. That's measuring sometimes where the students come in. Sometimes the school effect could even be negative and that's not shown if you just look at achievement. So achievement should be, letter grades should be based on growth in both proficiency and in TBAS because TBAS really measures the effect of um, that teachers, and, that teachers and schools have on students. But I've also heard rumor that possibly that you're looking at looking at just the absolute value, not AML growth, and to me that's the worst thing you could possibly do uh, because that's not looking at any kind of school effect on a student. That's basically me measuring socioeconomic level. But our teachers and our students work really, really hard. And we grow students every day. And we have multiple measures to show that we grow students every day. And that letter grade should be based on the work that we do with students and how we grow students, not how they come to us, but how they grow in their district. And if you just measure growth in proficiency levels, then your proficiency levels need to be adjusted. Because if you look the, at the approaching band, that approaching band in third grade literacy is anywhere from the 30th percentile to the 67th percentile. So I could grow multiple years within that band of proficiency and I'm still not going to get to on track. 
So, or met now, the new word. But making sure that we are looking at student growth, not just in proficiency level, but giving that incremental growth calculation with TVAS and other measures, I think is really important. And also, giving students, a, giving schools a letter grade just based on achievement gives the public a false impression, either positive or negative, of the effect that that school has on students. If I'm a parent, I want my student to go to a school that's going to take them from where they are and grow them. And that's the measure that should be used in determining letter grades. It should not be how your students come in or just a single measure of achievement, and certainly not the absolute value of achievement. Thank you so much, Suzanne. I appreciate those comments. We're going to go now to Steve Starnes. Just real quick before we do that, I do want to uh, take a moment to uh, clarify just one thing actually that you brought up and it was kind of rumor has it and what is actually going on and I want to just make sure to reiterate legislation does give us a lot of opportunity to kind of ex uh, exist in a white space and co-create but it also requires that both proficiency and growth be some component of the calculation so I just want to assure you on that part uh, that that component is in the law and yes we are communicating kind of over the course of these town halls and public comment period on what other indicators should be there? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's great. Thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate your thoughtful comments. Uh, Steve Starnes is going to be next. Director Starnes, we appreciate you signing up. Next is going to be Brandy Shelton. Brandy, if you could just raise your hand. I see you over here. We'll bring a microphone to you next. With that, Director Starnes, please go ahead. Thank you. Steve Starnes, Director of Greenville City Schools. And back when, in 2016, when this law was originally, originally passed as Public Chapter 680, the way that happens is once there's a public chapter, then that uh, affects Tennessee state law. There is a Tennessee state law in effect right now, 49-1-228, that as you pointed out, talks about TCAP test results and uh, TVAS results. But then it goes on down to say in that law that calculation would be identified and formulated prior to the 17-18 school year and it would be communicated to school districts prior to the 17-18 school year. That's happened. We have an accountability model in place right now that we have been working against the last several years and that I guess my question here is without additional legislation to change the law in effect at this time how can we change the measure based on last year's data I would understand if we went back to legislative session in January of 24 after the additional legislation which would have an impact on this law but the law as currently written is that the calculation method is already in place, been communicated to us, and that's what we should be measured on moving forward. Um, Dr. Bryant touched on a lot, of, a lot of good points there, but right now the calculation says that with achievement, there is either an absolute value or meeting your, basically to get an A, you have to meet your double AMO. So, and the AMO is an annual measurable objective. It's a target, and it's based on cutting your deficit from 100% in half over eight years is a, without going into a formal calculation there. But uh, I guess that's the comments that I have. Our results are already finished from last year go back and change the method which we're going to be measured after that has already happened I think is uh, I don't know if I want to use as strong a word as immoral but uh, it's definitely not right thank you thank you director Starnes for your comments uh, next up is Brandy Shelton I think I've got another person who has signed up on here I'll have to download it but Brandy if you want to come on uh, and get started with your comment I will pull this spreadsheet up and we will uh, have the next person here in just a minute. Let's go ahead with your time, ma'am. Hi, I'm Brandi Shelton. I serve as the System Data and Testing Coordinator for Greenville City Schools. And I just want to elaborate um, 
a little bit more on what Dr. Bryan and Mr. Starnes have uh, presented. I do have um, great concerns. We have heard mention with the accountability, or excuse me, the achievement portion of school accountability, um, which now consists of the best of the AMO pathway and the absolute pathway and the AMO pathway being removed. That would, of course, only leave the absolute performance pathway. And in doing that, that would basically make that measure achievement at one point in time. We know there's a strong correlation between achievement and socioeconomic sta status. And currently, the achievement piece of that accountability pack accounts for 45% for K-8 schools and 30% for high schools. So uh, that would impact the letter grade assigned to a school. The socioeconomic status will be weighting that again at 45% for K-8 and 30% for high schools. So we do strongly advocate the AMO pathway being left in there and rather than the achievement piece being so strongly correlated to socioeconomic status. Thank you very much, Brandy. I appreciate those comments. Next up, we have Lena Luttrell. It might be Lana Luttrell signed up to speak. We see you. Good afternoon. Come on up and get started when you're ready. Um, I would just like to reiterate the things that my colleagues have said about the AMO, uh, the fairness of our students. I don't think any person in this room got into education because they didn't want to see kids succeed. Um, the thing I'd like to speak about is chronic absenteeism. I think it is a great measure. We all know that students have to be present in order to learn and, and receive the instruction that our teachers have worked so hard to prepare for them. Chronically absent, the way it's currently measured with the 18 days, is based only on absence. It's not whether it's excused or unexcused. We have no control over whether students go to a doctor, get a statement, and we have students who miss 35 days. That's not in our control. Anything over 18 days, they're considered chronically absent. Uh, that doesn't take into account if they've had an accident or a chronic illness or any of those things. Uh, they would have to be medically impaired in order for that to not count. What we would like to consider, what I would like for you to consider is when they are absent, if it's an unexcused absence. We do a, a, a job that we hold them accountable in a truancy court and they have our, our tiered system, their tier one, we do a contract with them at tier two. We go to truancy court, we go to truancy board, we have things in place to support them. We have no control over um, an absenteeism when they have an excuse. Um, so I would hope that that metric of attendance be measured on unexcused absences. We have a very supportive court system here in Greene County. Judge Bailey does a great job in holding kids accountable and supporting schools. So we would ask that it would be considered that it's unexcused absences over a certain amount rather than maybe bar the door if they need doctor will buy an excuse or a parent ready. Thank you, Ms. Luttrell, for your comments. I think that is the conclusion of the folks who have signed up thus far online. I'm going to check one more time to make sure we haven't had anyone additional sign up. We have not. Uh, so at this point in time, I'll kind of do a last call for comments of, of folks who are in the room. We've had a really good discussion today, and I appreciate actually deeply the thought that you all are putting into this and more importantly that you are vocalizing that and kind of putting it into the, the the forum of discussion here as i mentioned the department is really trying to work with tennesseans all across the state give all folks opportunity to provide their input on this very important topic uh, so if there are any others in the room who would like to speak i'm kind of looking around for you to, to shoot your hand up if not give us a little bit of thinking time All right, I think that's going to com complete the list of folks who would like to sign up to speak. Um, I do want to put a slide up with the email address to remind you all of the opportunity. You can send uh, everything that you've shared with us tonight is kind of on the books and, and in consideration, of course. You can send us more. You can send us new additional feedback at any time. Uh, that is going to be available through September 15th. So encourage you all to take advantage of that opportunity, spread the word, kind of get your folks to uh, be aware of the opportunity to engage here because as I mentioned, later this fall will be the first implementation of this piece of legislation where we see 
on a report card, school letter grades uh, uh, kind of going live for the first time. So we want to be very intentional about how we're co-creating this together. Again, that email account is school letter grades at tnedu.gov. All right, folks, I want to thank you deeply for your time this afternoon. I appreciate it. I, I am definitely looking forward to receiving more public comment from you. Thanks for having us here in Greenville. We'll look forward to continuing the conversation.